Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Exactly on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement, which in Hebrew we call Yom Kippur. It literally means covering. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls. In the Hebrew, it's la'anot nafshot chem. You shall torment or torture your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. Neither shall you do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And as for any person who does any work on this same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no work at all. It's to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all of your dwelling places. <clears throat> it is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month at evening. From evening until evening, you shall keep your Shabbat, Sabbath. And again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth of this month is the Feast of Booths for seven days to the Lord. On the first day, as a holy convocation, you shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days, you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord as an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. These are the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocation, to present offerings by fire to the Lord, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and libations, each day's manner on its own day, in addition to those of the Sabbaths of the Lord, and in addition to your gifts, and in addition to all of your votive and free will offerings, which you shall give to the Lord. On exactly the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with the rest on the first day, and the rest on the eighth. Now on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year, and it shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths for seven days, all the native born of Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I have the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our minds, and above all our hearts to the glory and meaning of your word. Empowering us, Lord God, in your grace to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. The Jewish calendar. Lord willing, tonight, we'll look at it as well. Tonight, we'll examine the spring holidays. But this morning, we'll look at the autumn holidays. The autumn holidays. Can you see this reasonably well? These are the spring holidays. Passover or Pesach, first fruits, which is the first day of the week of Passover week, and the Feast of Weeks. We call it in Hebrew Pesach, and this we call Hag Shavuot. Then comes the summer, and then we have the three autumn feasts. The Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. 
Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year, New Year. The rabbis changed the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets to Rosh Hashanah. But as we see in Leviticus, the original beginning of the year was not the Feast of Trumpets in the autumn, but the first of Nisan, roughly the first of April. This is the Mosaic calendar. This is a little bit complicated. Pay attention. This calendar is a type of something the Bible calls, or what theologians call, Heilsgeschichte, salvation history. They like giving fancy German names to things so other people don't know what they're talking about. Instead of making the Word of God understandable to ordinary people, they like to create a priestly class for themselves and hide the knowledge from the other people the way the Pharisees did too often. That's unfortunately true. Most theolo theology is written for theologians. Instead of being servants of people, they write books for each other. Not all of them, but a lot of them. It's a type of salvation history. That's what Heil's Geschichte means, salvation history. God's redemptive plan for mankind and for Israel is bound up in the symbolism of this calendar. Jesus fulfills the spring holidays in his first coming. In his first coming, he's the Passover lamb, as we'll see tonight. In his first coming, he's the first fruit of the resurrection. And in his first coming, the Holy Spirit is outpoured on the church on the day of Pentecost. Then you have a long, hot summer in the Middle East. Very long and very hot. Then in the autumn, comes the autumn holidays, and Jesus fulfills the autumn holidays, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Booths, which we call uh, Haga Sukkot and Yom Kippur. He fulfills these in his second coming. This calendar is a type of history. The Jewish months are a lunar calendar based on 28 days. That's why you have the, lo the, the new moon feast commemorated in the Bible. This is it in a circular pattern. The Talmudic literature goes to great lengths to explain the 28-day months in the annual Jewish cycle of a 360-day year. That's all of history bound up in the typology of this calendar. For instance, the rabbis would even equate the 28 days of the, uh, of, of the lunar month with female menstrual cycles, because that was important when someone was ritually clean and ritually unclean. Things like seminal emission and menstrual blood were considered sacrosanct in the Hebrew faith, partly because it was a polemic against the paganistic religions which had ungodly sexual practices and, and because God wanted to demonstrate the sanctity of human sexuality and human life. So all these things were very important to them. The calendar had three main purposes. It was a civil calendar, it was a religious calendar, but it was the annual agricultural cycle. If you wanted to look at it very briefly, those are the months. Different months, the winds go in different directions, and there's different kinds of precipitation, causing different kinds of crops to be harvested. Different months, different winds, different climactic conditions with precipitation and different things being harvested. The Hebrew word for wind is ruach. It is the same word for spirit. There are different spiritual climates at different points in history. Now remember, it is first of all an agricultural calendar. First of all, it is an agricultural calendar. In the Middle East, you have two rainy seasons, the spring one and the autumn one. You know about former and latter rains in the Bible. As we mentioned last night, in biblical typology, different liquids represent or typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his ministry. For instance, New wine is the joy of the Holy Spirit in worship. That's what we read in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 7 and 8. 
The new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh. The gaiety of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the reveler stops, the gaiety of the harp ceases. So much for the charismatic movement, but there you see the new wine, that liquid, is the joy of the spirit in worship. Another liquid is oil. We call it in Hebrew shemen. It is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But probably the most common and debatably the most important of these liquids is rain, producing something called maim hayim in Hebrew, living water. <laughs> living water. Let's look at John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. John 7, 38 and 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Now the background of this is the feast of booths. I'll explain this in a moment. And Jesus is drawing on the background text of Ezekiel 47, which points something apparently to the millennia. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well, I will give you living water. In other words, the Messiah would give the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13. My people have committed two evils against me. The first evil is that they would forsake him, the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah predicts the Jews would nationally, by and large, reject the Messiah who would give the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. The outpouring of rain, feeding the water tables, producing maim hayim, living water, that's the Holy Spirit being outpoured. It says it continually. And Isaiah and Jeremiah says it in John in two places. Jesus gives the living water. He gives the Holy Spirit. You have two gigantic outpourings of rain, the spring and the autumn. Each one prepares a harvest. The spring rain is chiefly grains. The autumn one is chiefly fruits. Fruit. Now, you have a long, hot summer where there's very little rain. Israel is agriculturally reliant on the water that's already been built up in the Sea of Galilee and on the melting ice caps of Mount Hermon. All the years I lived in Israel, it only rained once in a while, here and there, now and then, for the long, hot summer, bearing in mind in the Middle East, the long, hot summer, by far, is the biggest section of the year, in terms of climate and temperature, and meteorologically, and so on. You have a big pouring of, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early church, and you have a big pour, outpouring in the last days. This is why, one reason why, you see such an abundance of gifts of the Spirit in the early church, and why you see such an abundance of the gifts of the Spirit in the last days, but for centuries, you see it here and there, now and then, not much. You understand? It's also why you see an abundance of Jews harvested. It's a Jewish calendar. You see an abundance of Jews coming to faith in the early church, in the book of Acts, and you see an abundance of Jews coming to faith in the last days, as it says in Romans 11, will happen, and as is already beginning to happen today. Now, why is it that a very successful evangelist, who's a powerful speaker, who carries a gifting, a calling, like someone like Reinhard Bunke, German chap, I don't know much about Reinhard Bunke, but from what I can see, he preaches an honest gospel. He's not into the money prosperity thing, like too many Pentecostals are. And he also gives signs and wonders their appropriate place. These signs follow them. He never amplifies miracles or healings above repentance. 
He seems to be a pretty good guy from what I know about him. I don't know much about him, but from the videos I've seen, he seems to be a pretty good guy. But why is it that somebody like Reinhard Bunke will go to Africa and thousands and thousands and thousands of people will be saved at one meeting? But when he goes to his own country, Germany, or to England or to Australia, practically nothing whatsoever happens. The same person, the same gifting, the same calling, and in his own country, nothing happens. Look at Amos chapter 4, verse 7. <clears throat> and furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One place would be rained on, while the place not rained on would be dried up. You see that? It rains here, it rains there. Where it rains, there's a harvest. No rain, no grain. It's raining in Africa. It's raining in the Philippines. It's raining in much of Asia. It's raining throughout Latin America. There's a drought in New Zealand. There's a drought in Australia. There's a drought in most of the United States. There's a drought in most of Western Europe. A drought in Great Britain. Where it's raining, you have grain. There's a harvest. Where there's no rain, there's no harvest. Doesn't work. Most of the things that people have tried to get the church moving have not worked. People try to give you formulas to get the church moving and growing again. With the Vineyard and John Wimber, it's the power encounters and the uh, triumphalist eschatology on back of it, these kinds of thinking, and, and, and prophets who predict things that don't happen. The way, again, we had in Britain when Mr. Wimber and Paul Kane came and predicted the great revival of 1990, and in the three and a half years since that time, more mosques built in England than churches. It just doesn't work. Why? has the vineyard and Mr. Wimber's teaching so categorically failed to turn the church around. Because it isn't raining. God's grace is sovereign. He pours out his spirit when he will, where he will. Only God can make it rain. The charismatic movement is 26 years old. 26 years old. Now, I believe the charismatic movement began as a genuine work of God's spirit. It began that way. But once again... Look at the long-term effects. Society is far worse off now than it was 26 years ago. There's far more abortion, far more crime, far more drug abuse, far more divorce, far more homosexuality, far more social injustice. The charismatic movement has categorically failed to change society because it's categorically failed to change the church. The only churches it's done any good to are ones like yours. Baptist-type churches who already had a strong emphasis on the Word and then opened to the Spirit. But these other churches that didn't have a strong emphasis on the Word, like the Church of England, look what's happened. Once again, 26 years ago, you wouldn't have found bishops denying the resurrection or the virgin birth or Hindu gods being worshipped in Anglican churches. It's far worse off now than it was before the quote-unquote renewal. The Roman Catholic Church, and what happened there is even more tragic. People praying in tongues to Mary hasn't changed that church. Unless people respond to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit by repenting and going back to the Word of God, it won't matter. It'll dry up and evaporate. Formulae don't work. The Dominionist, Kingdom Now Theology, what's on back of the thinking of Graham Kendrick, who organizes the March for Jesus. Not just the annihilationism, which says... Hell is a place of annihilation, and if you don't repent and accept Jesus, when you die, you won't exist anymore. That's the thinking of it. But the triumphalism, where instead of evangelism being emphasized, we speak into the heavenlies and proclaim and make kingdom proclamation. It comes from a Gnostic idea, or a misunderstanding of certain verses in a Gnostic way, that we speak into, speak into being the things which are not. While the idea of Christians of all backgrounds standing together lifting up Jesus is quite good as long as they're preaching the gospel. But when triumphalist proclamation becomes the emphasis instead of what the Bible says should be, you see why this stuff doesn't work. 
You see why these marches take place and society just doesn't work. doesn't work. No formula of man will work. The biggest failure has been something called the church growth movement in the United States. It began in Fuller Seminary by someone who was really quite right in most of what he said, someone named Donald McGavern. He said we have to statistically analyze church growth and church attendance and numbers getting saved to see what God is really doing so we don't deceive ourselves with religious nonsense. And he emphasized something called the homogeneous unit, which was quite a good idea for the mission field, foreign countries, not turning people in New Guinea into Westerners, but it does not seem to have worked very well in most of the Western countries. The church is not growing in America. The most it's basically doing is replacing itself. As people die, the numbers stay pretty much the same. Most of the comprehensive studies, like the Hunter study and the Barnard study, and even the Gallup polls, show that, that the church is not growing. The places that have tried to follow church growth ideas haven't worked. What they do is they send sociologists and anthropologists to places where a lot of people are getting saved and try to say, well, how are they implementing biblical principles? And if we imitate those principles in our country, our churches will grow. Well, it's like saying, well, Reinhard Bunke is seeing a lot of people saved in Africa, so we'll bring him to New Zealand and then it'll happen here too. But it doesn't work. Why? Amos 4, 7. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I would send rain on one city, and on another city, I would not send rain. One place would be rained on, while the place not rained on would be burned up. God's grace is sovereign. He'll pour out his spirit. There's a teaching that I, I do sometimes on Elijah. Elijah was a man who could make it rain. And God is looking for people like Elijah who can make it rain. That's the key. But that's another issue. If you really want to get the church going, study the ministry of Elijah. Now, the rain comes and gives a big harvest. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Agnus Dei Quitolis Tecatumundi, if you went to Catholic school. The same day that the Sanhedrin inspected the lamb, because the lamb for Passover, we call it Se Pesach in Hebrew, had to be without spot or blemish, because to God, one man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin. That's how one could die for all. They couldn't find anything wrong with the lamb. They'd take it out and sacrifice it. So with Jesus, when they put him in, on trial, not being able to find anything wrong with him, they sacrificed him. The same day when the Sanhedrin were responsible for inspecting the lambs to see if they had anything wrong with them, and if they weren't, they would take them out and kill them. It's the same day, most probably, they put Jesus on trial. And not finding anything wrong with him, they took him out and sacrificed him. The trial of Jesus was completely illegal according to both Jewish and Roman law. Then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It goes on for a week, but the first day of that week is the first fruits, Sunday morning. The high priest would go out into the Kidron Valley, which lies between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, precisely at sunrise. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus rose at sunrise, thereabouts. The rising of the S-U-N is a metaphor for the rising of the S-O-N. And the high priest would go into the Kidron Valley, precisely at sunrise, and ritually harvest the first bit of grain offering coming up out of the Kidron, and ceremonially bring it into the temple. When the high priest was harvesting what he called the first fruit, Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20. We'll explain this, Lord willing, in greater depth this evening. On the... Uh, Spring holidays tape, the Jewish perspective of Palm Sunday. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what we read then in verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. That's him. Seven weeks later is Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Now at Passover, 
The Song of Solomon is read in the synagogues. The allegory, Solomon's relationship with Shulamit, representing or typifying the Messiah's relationship with his bride. We'll look at that tonight. But on the Feast of Weeks, we read Amegilat Ruth in the synagogues, the book of Ruth or the scroll of Ruth, the story of a Jewish man who comes for a Gentile bride, a rich, powerful Jewish man who takes a Gentile bride, the Messiah coming for the Gentile church. This is bride. Then comes the long, hot summer. The long, hot summer represents the time of the Gentiles. Daniel, Luke 21, 24, Romans 11, they all deal with it from different aspects. The time of the Gentiles, when God turns his grace from the Jews to the Gentiles. But then in the last days, he goes back to dealing with the Jews. Why? God does not love Jews more than anybody else, but he chose them to bless everybody else. And the Jews are God's timepiece for the nations. His timepiece. In the Antichrist seminar, I explained it, where it says in John's epistle, little children, it is the last hour. You think of a rugby game scheduled to end at 7 o'clock. But someone is watching the game, and his wife says, when do you want your dinner? And he says, I would like my dinner at 7 o'clock, please, when the game is over. But at 10 minutes to 7, when there's 10 minutes left in the game, a very good rugby player is injured seriously, the way my friend Mike Jones, who plays for the All Blacks, was injured in Argentina. And they come out onto the field and they say, we can't move him. We have to get a doctor and an ambulance before we can move him or he may be paralyzed. Stop the clock. There's 10 minutes left in the game. Meantime, the ambulance is on its way, but at 7 o'clock, the game should be over. The man's dinner, his wife's put it on the table and says, come on, your dinner's ready. He said, but the game's not over yet. His wife said, well, you told me you want your dinner at 7. The game would be over at 7 o'clock. He said, there was 10 minutes left in the game. He said, yeah, I know I did. But something happened, the game's not over. So his wife says, well, how long is left in the game? He says, well, there's 10 minutes left in the game. The referee stopped the clock. But there was 10 minutes in the game 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I know, but there's still 10 minutes left in the game. Well, I better put this in the microwave. Next time, make up your mind. At any moment, the clock can begin again. The ambulance come, comes, they take the injured player off the field, and there it goes. Time is frozen. You understand? The time of the Gentiles comes to an end, and God goes back dealing with and through the Jews. And we see all the signs of that happening. Jesus said directly in Luke 21, when you see Jerusalem trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles, it will remain trampled down until the time of the Gentiles are completed. Now, the time of the Gentiles are not over yet, the ultimate fulfillment of that is still to happen, but we certainly see the transition underway. And the numbers of Jewish people coming to faith, as Paul says in Romans 11, would happen after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. We see that transition is underway. We're certainly in the last days. Israel proves that it. it's God's timepiece. It's one of the things that prove it. So you've got this season of rain giving a spring harvest. Long, hot summer, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter in the Middle East. We have something in Israel called the Hamsin. It comes from the Arabic word meaning 50, but others related to China. It's a desert wind that blows in all the way. It begins probably in Baluchistan or somewhere in Central Asia. And it blows in down across the Arabian Peninsula and up through the Middle East. What the wind chill factor is, you know what the wind chill factor is? The wind makes it seem like it's colder than it actually is in terms of temperature. Hamsin is the opposite. It makes it seem hotter than it actually is because of the wind, blowing the hot air off the desert. It's a grueling time in the Middle East. Remember, different seasons of rain at different months, but also which way the wind is going. You have favorable wind conditions and unfavorable ones. For instance, in Acts 27, the ship gets storm-tossed by a Euriclio, Euriclio, an east northeast wind. That's an adverse wind. It's a dangerous wind. Uh, it can storm-toss a boat, and that's probably the wind that would have storm-tossed the Dugit, the fishing boat of Jesus and the apostles on the Sea of Galilee. 
would have happened that time of year. Separate subject, we deal with it, we explain the typology of it on the uh, tape, The Future History of the Church. Acts 27 is a type of the church in the Great Tribulation. The sun and moon aren't giving their light and so on. Now, in the autumn, out of nowhere, it begins raining again. Only the second rain is greater than the first. What happens? We have these dried up riverbeds in the Middle East called wadis. And they become flash flood zones. All kinds of life begins springing up out of nowhere where there was nothing but desert. And it rains, and it rains, and it rains. And you have three holidays. The first is trumpets, the second is Yom Kippur, and the third is booze. Jesus fulfills the spring holidays in his first coming, as we'll see tonight, as the son of Joseph, Hamashiach ben Yosef. In the second coming, he comes as Hamashiach ben David, which I'll explain, Lord willing, tonight. And he fulfills the autumn holidays. So it's an agricultural calendar. Now, God gave the Jews this calendar for three reasons. The first reason is this. It is a polemic against paganism. The pagan Canaanites and other people of paganistic religions in the Middle East had holidays the same time of year, even the same days. Even similar sacrificial systems to the Jews. The code of Hammurabi was even a very similar legal code to the Jews. That's why there's so much detail in Leviticus and in the Torah being specific, because it would have been so easy to mix biblical Judaism with paganism. The same is true for Christianity. So much of the pagan world looked like Judaism, had the same holidays, the same day, the same kinds of sacrifices, even the same rules. It was the details that showed the big differences very often. And it's the same with us. We have to remember that when we deal with the seductions of ecumenism and getting in with Rome. So much of it looks like what we believe, that it's very easy to cross the line, not realizing it's not a thin line at all, but it's a great chasm. We've got to look at the details of God's word. Otherwise, we'll fall into the same kind of spiritual seduction idolatry and backsliding is Israel. And many churches are doing that. The pagans gave praise and thanks to false gods, to demons. Other gods are called demons in Hebrew, Shadim. Paul calls them demons in 1 Corinthians, demonoi in Greek. They were praising demons, other gods, for the rain and for the provision for the harvest. God wanted the Jews to praise Yahweh. The righteous shall live by faith, and they had to trust God to send the rain and the harvest. So it was a polemic against paganism. When you witness the Jewish people, one of the things they'll say, Christmas is a pagan holiday. Well, unfortunately, they're right, so is Easter. But you can quickly point out that Hanukkah, the 25th of the Jewish month of Kislev, was also a <laughs> Jewish feast of lights. You have feast of lights in Hinduism. So if Christmas, the 25th of December, comes from the pagan Roman feast, the 25th of the feast of Saturnalia, that's true, but... What about Hanukkah being the 25th of Kislev, approximating the same time? The pagans had holidays the same time, which were also agricultural feasts, thanking their gods. But God wanted the Jews to thank the true God. That's the first reason. The second reason is this. These holidays remembered what God did for them in the past. The Passover remembered God's provision for them in the wilderness. I'm sorry, the, God's deliverance to them from Egypt. The Feast of Booths reminded them of God's provision for them in the wilderness, in the Exodus. The principle is true for us. We don't need to observe religious holidays if we don't want to. Colossians and Romans says that that's a personal matter of faith and choice. However, we need to remember the principles. God wanted the Jews to remember the things he already did for them, the needs he already met, the provisions he already made, the crisis situations he already delivered them out of, in order to give them the faith to trust him for the present and the future. The same is true for us. We should remember what Jesus has already done for us, the needs he's already met, the times he's delivered us in the past, should give us the faith to trust him for the present and the future. That's the second reason. But the third reason 
is this idea of Heil's Geschichte. Salvation history, it's an outline of God's prophetic plan for salvation. Let's look at these three autumn holidays. These three autumn holidays. The first is the Feast of Trumpets. Let's look at what the Feast of Trumpets means. Let's look at Joel chapter 2. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes from Joel chapter 2. Somehow, what happened on the day of Pentecost is recapitulated or repeated. So it shall be in the last days, what you saw in the early church comes back. There is a latter day reign. What we need to be careful of are the errors of restorationism and kingdom now theology <clears throat> and Mr. Wimber's theology. It's all totally false. The latter day reign, the manifest sons of God. John Wimber teaches that Joel's army are his followers and the people who follow his power theology. And this is how he would read it. A fire consumes before them in verse 3, and on back of them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness on back of them, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses, so they run. With the noise of chariots, they leap on top of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stumble like a mighty people arranged for battle. Before them, the people are in anguish and all the faces turn pale. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like soldiers. They each march in line, nor do they deviate from their paths. They do not crowd each other. They march everyone in his path. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break the ranks. They rush on the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. And the earth quakes before them and all this stuff. And then it goes on talking about locusts that are going to devour. Now, the Wimber theology is that this is his followers and the people who believe what he teaches. This is what he taught when he falsely predicted revival would come to England, and it didn't. Uh, this replays what happened, or it talks about, and it sits in leave, and it's historical content, what happened with Nebuchadnezzar's army. Whatever it means for the last days, it does not mean what John Wimber is telling people. Look at verse 20. But I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its back guard into the western sea, and its stench will arise, and its foul smell will come up. It has done great things. Like Nebuchadnezzar's army, Joel's army is a wicked, evil army that God will destroy. He will judge it and destroy it. Now, while John Wimber and Jack Beer and the Vineyard teach it, his followers, the Bible says something else. You've got to understand how they arrive at this conclusion. These people are what, in theological terms, are Gnostics. They're not reading the Bible. They're claiming Gnosos, a subjective revelation. Instead of using the symbolism and typology to illustrate doctrine, what they're, of course, doing is claiming a Gnosos, a subjective mystical insight into the symbols, and then reinterpreting the plain meaning in that light. It's a terrible heresy that devastated the early church and deceived the early church and led many people into all kinds of crazy things, and it's doing the same thing today. John Wimber is, by theological definition, a Gnostic. Not only is he somebody, according to Deuteronomy 18 and Jeremiah 28, the false prophet, because he predicts things that didn't happen. Neve Sheker in Hebrew, but he's a Gnostic, theologically. This is what he did. Now, if you want to be part of his army, you can join the vineyard and pay $100 or $200 for his course on how to have a power encounter, but if you don't want to be part of an army that God's going to destroy and cast into the sea and its stench will go up, you can, instead of spending one or two hundred for one of his courses, you can spend ten or fifteen dollars on a Bible and read it. <laughs> but you can't believe both. You can't believe John Wimber and the Word of God. You have to make a choice because they're mutually exclusive. As you can read for yourself. Joel does talk about the last days and what will happen. But in what sense? Let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. 
Now, again, restoration theology says they're blowing the trumpet to warn about them. <laughs> they're going to conquer the whole church before Christ comes. And then when they've taken over the whole church, they'll take over the whole world. And anybody who stands in their way, they're going to get rid of. I know a case in Australia where there was a, a vineyard pastor who was whose teaching was accosted by a Baptist guy. And the Baptist guy said, this is crazy, it's not biblical. And the vineyard pastor, or the guy who followed the vineyard, called him up and, and said, God's going to judge you and do this and this and this, and I pronounce this judgment on you, and on your church, and on your family, and all this stuff. And it'll come about within one year. Then you'll know that you've stood in the way of the mighty army of God. <laughs> so the guy calls back a year later, said, my wife just had a beautiful baby. We thought she wouldn't have another baby, but she did. The church has grown by at least 60% since I've last seen you, and my elders just gave me a raise. So the vineyard guy says, well, the timing was wrong. It's <laughs> <laughs> all rubbish. Blow a trumpet. Look at verse 15. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Joel 1, 14 to 16. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of God and cry out, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. Now, blowing a trumpet has to do with warning of impending judgment and impending doom. That's what it means comes about the first of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. Tishrei. How do we really get this latter-day rain? What is the key to it? Look at verse 17. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and do not make thine inheritance a reproach. God's people repent, and the leaders ask for mercy. They weep in the temple. Then I will remove the northern army from you, in verse 20, and judge it and destroy it. Verse 25, I will make up for you the years which the swarming locust has eaten. Then in verse 28, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men, dream, your young men see visions. And on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit. Again, the idea of rain. It's in spring rain. It's the holiday of the spring harvest following the rain. And I will display wonders in the sky and on earth above, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, etc. How do we get this latter-day rain? Remember, these signs and wonders didn't happen in the day of Pentecost. There was no blood on the moon, and there was no fire and smoke. Even if those things do happen as astral phenomena, and I don't say it won't happen, there's a figurative meaning in it. Remember, the sun is Jesus, the rising of the sun. He's the light, the true light. The moon has no light of its own. It only reflects the light of the sun. What that means is the blood on the moon, the persecution of the church and its leaders. The light of Jesus not being reflected when it turns dark, and so on. That's what those things mean. If you see these things happening in the heavens, they're figures or illustrations of what's happening spiritually at the time when these things come to pass. There's a dual meaning. Again, the example is when the temple veil was torn from top to the ground. A physical event happened, but the physical event was not what was most important. What was most important is what it meant when Jesus died on the cross. Sinful man was no longer separated from holy God, and we could enter the Holy of Holies now. If these things happen physically, and I don't say they won't, they're only going to be representations of something deeper, which is spiritually true. Nonetheless, let's continue with this idea of the trumpets. Yes, there is a latter-day rain, and it begins by putting the trumpet to our mouths and warning people. But it has to do with the church repenting. That's how it happens. It doesn't have anything to do with what restorationism and kingdom now and vineyard and all this stuff teaches. It's totally absurd. Read it for yourself. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. 
as we'll look at tonight, verse 12 has to do with the Bedikat Chametz, the Passover. I'll search Jerusalem with lamps. But then, verses 14 to 16 has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly, listen, the day of the Lord, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities. Says the same thing as Joel, doesn't it? Set the trumpet to thy mouth. Hosea chapter 8, verse 1. Hosea 8, 1. Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord, because they've transgressed my covenant and rebelled against me. The judgments that come have to do with sin among God's people. Always have and always will, but that will be increasingly true in the last days. It's not just God's judgment against the world. Judgment begins in the house of God. Now, let's continue. Isaiah 27, 13. It will come about also on that day that a great trumpet will be blown. And those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered abroad, etc., will come about and worship in the house of the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Amos 3, 6. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in the city, has not the Lord done it? These things come from God. Trumpets. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, we read something about a trumpet. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. That's what we're told. But similarly, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now when we look at Leviticus, we see something. The last trumpet is not actually the trumpet blown on the Feast of Trumpets. The last trumpet is actually blown on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a trumpet is also blown. Leviticus 25, verse 9. You shall then sound the ram's horn, called the shofar, on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound the horn all through your land. That is the last trumpet. It is not the Feast of Trumpets. On the Feast of Trumpets to this day, which the Jews now call Rosh Hashanah, you have a ceremony called Tashlik. About two years ago, I was in Jerusalem at the Pool of Shiloach where Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man. And they take a verse from Malachi, I think, about your sins being cast into the sea, and they read about it, and they go down at Tashlik and try to cast their sins into the flowing water at the Pool of Shiloach outside the old city of Jerusalem. 
exactly where Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, you'll see Orthodox Jews down there to this day trying to get rid of their sin at Tashlich. I only hope that he opens the eyes of the blind once again. Getting rid of your sin and blowing the trumpet. We have a person who blows the trumpet called Abal Tekiach, master of the blowing, and he begins practicing. In between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur, we have 10 days, days of awe, Hayamim Anoraim, the days of awe, when Jews are supposed to torture their souls concerning their sin, coming up to the Feast of Atonement, Day of Atonement. Now we'll continue with this in a moment, but let's look, first of all, at this idea of the trumpet. In Revelation 8 and 9, this is what we see. The trumpets. The trumpets are being blown. The trumpets come out of the seventh seal. If you were here for the Antichrist seminar, we explained it. What you have is a Midrashic replay of the story of Joshua. In Joshua, they had to march around Jericho seven days in Joshua chapter 6. But the seventh day, they had to march around seven times. In Revelation, you have seven seals, but the seventh seal has a subset of seven. So you have the same numerical pattern. That's important in Midrash. But secondly, the Levites had to be totally silent when they were marching around Jericho in Joshua 6. Silence. And as I pointed out, one of the most difficult verses in the Bible for me is there's silence in heaven for a half hour. How do you apply time to eternity? Nonetheless, there's silence in heaven for a half hour. I, I only partly understand that verse. Silence marching around Jericho was silence in heaven. They blow the last trumpet in Jericho, and the walls came down. The first place I ever kissed my wife, at that time my girlfriend, was in Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. When the walls come down in Joshua, it says, this city has been given to us by the Lord. In Revelation, what happens when they blow the last trumpet? This world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. Finally, you've got the Metagrain. Joshua sends in two spies to rescue the Gentile woman who in some way typifies the Gentile church. Revelation, what happens at this point? You read it up to Revelation 11. Fits the exact sequence, pattern of events, the two witnesses. Somehow, those two spies sent in by Joshua, Yehoshua, typify and teach about the two witnesses in Revelation. Remember, Jesus' name, Yeshua, is simply the way you say Joshua, Yehoshua, after the Babylonian captivity, they have the same name. Joshua sends in two spies. Jesus sends in his two spies, Revelation and Joshua. The last trumpet has to do something with that pattern midrashically. The first comes the warning, but the last trumpet is actually the Day of Atonement. We'll come back to this. Let's continue now. This is, you find this by comparing Joshua 6, 1 to 16, up with the stories of uh, the trumpets and seals, commencing in Revelation 11:15. 15. 
Then you have the days of awe when the Jews torment their souls. Very briefly, putting the trumpet to your mouth. The first thing you have to do to be ready for Jesus to come is to put the trumpet to your mouth. Remember, the Jews were not ready for his first coming because they didn't properly understand the spring holidays. Christians will not be ready for his second coming unless they properly understand the autumn holidays. I don't mean celebrate the holidays themselves. We're not under the law. But I mean the theology of the holidays. Evangelism is always important. Always. It says in Ezekiel 30, uh, 33, 11, and in Ezekiel chapter 3, if you don't warn the wicked to repent, I will require their blood of your hands. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, we read, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some count slowness, but not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, and that'll be it. The elements will be dissolved with fire. It's quite interesting that the word there is storkie in Greek, meaning the elements will be dissolved with fire. Before Einstein, nobody knew you could split an atom, except for a fisherman from Galilee in 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. The Greeks didn't know about subatomic particles. They only knew about elements, stoichiae. Atmos means in Greek that which is indivisible. Nonetheless, the point is this. Evangelism is always important. But in the last days, it becomes particularly important. Every unsaved person is running out of time. Every day they live, God is giving them a chance to get saved, to work out their salvation. Every day. But we reach a point in time when prophecy begins to be fulfilled where we have to set the trumpets to our mouths. Not only are people running out of time as individuals, but in the last days, as it says in Peter, the human race runs out of time. The human race is running out of time. Evangelism is always important, but in the last days it becomes especially important. It is a midrashic idea known as kal the homer, light to heavy. It is the first of the seven midot of Rabbi Hillel, who was the professor of St. Paul. We call it kal, meaning light to heavy. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, please. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Light to heavy. Kal, what's light? Forsake not the fellowshipping one with another. Fellowship is always important but especially as you see the day approaching. That's the heavy. Things that are always important become especially important as we get closer to the return of Jesus. Fellowship is always important, but the closer we get to the return of Jesus, it becomes more important. If people can't stand together, they'll never stand alone. So it is with witnessing. Evangelism is always important. But in the last days, it becomes especially important. There is a clear biblical directive, I'm convinced, for the kind of thing that Hal Lindsey does in America and Barry Smith does in your country. Looking at world events, telling unsaved people, unsaved people, these things fulfill prophecy. Jesus is coming. You're running out of time. You should get saved. That kind of evangelism, using eschatological events and biblical prophecy to witness, there's a clear biblical reason for doing it. People like Hal Lindsey and Barry Smith, whether you agree with everything they say or not, they're generally right in what they say, and they're certainly right in what they're doing. World events are, broadly speaking, lining up with prophecy, and we need to show that to the unsaved to cause them to get saved. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. In the synagogues, they read the book of Jonah this day. Why Jonah? 
because as Jonah was three days in the stomach of the great fish, so the Son of Man was three days in the tomb. The Jewish people don't know why they celebrate their holidays, but they do it anyway. Much the same as Christians very often don't know what they're doing, but they do it anyway. Especially Charismatics and Pentecostals like me. The details of the Day of Atonement are explained in Leviticus 16. Now pay attention. The father of John the Baptist was the high priest that year. In the Holy of Holies, in the first temple, not the second, was the ark. It was made out of wood covered with gold, the wood being the, representing the humanity of Jesus. The gold is divinity. Inside the ark was the law. The lid or the cover is called the mercy seat. The two cherubs on either side are the two angels that appear with Jesus at his resurrection, the two angels that appear with Jesus uh, at his ascension, etc. It's interesting that Satan was one of those angels before he fell. He had that place. If you read what it says about him in the Old Testament, you were the anointed cherub next to, next to the Lord. The law is inside the box. The law teaches us about our sin and that we're condemned before a holy God, but the covering of it is called the mercy seat. You have two thrones of judgment in the Bible. Thronos and Bima. Thronos is where we get the word throne. It's the place of judgment unto condemnation where the kings would pass sentences on the people who were going to be executed, etc. The Bema, however, was where the kings on the polices of ancient Greece would give the awards to the people who won the competition in the Olympics. Unsaved people appear before the Thronos. Christians appear before the Bema. Unsaved people are judged unto condemnation. Christians are judged unto their reward or lack of it. So the works will be burned up, but they will be saved but as if by fire. The mercy seat that covers the ark corresponds to the Bema. Jesus dwells there in the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah. He's between the two cherubs on the mercy seat. The Bema, that's him. He covers the law. The law condemns, but mercy covers it. That's Jesus. You understand? This is in the Holy of Holies, the innermost chamber of the temple, where the high priest would enter once a year, as is described in depth in Hebrews. Jesus is a type, or the high priest is a type of Jesus. He's our high priest. Now, the high priest, like John the Baptist's father, would have to go in with a velvet rope fastened around his ankle and bells on the fringes of his priestly ephod and frock. If the high priest had unconfessed sin in his own life, he would drop dead. They'd hear the bells ring and they'd pull him out. That's the Day of Atonement. The people had to torture their souls, but the leader, the high priest, he had to, most of all, torture his own soul for the sins of the people. The Jews begin by singing something called the Kol Nidre at Yom Kippur. It's an Aramaic hymn. It is not a Hebrew hymn. The fact that it's Aramaic tells us that it was around in the time of Jesus or thereabout the Second Temple period. That's important. The rabbis today say the Kol Nidre, which literally means all vows, goes back to the Jews being persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church in the Spanish Inquisition. The vows being forced to be baptized again to save their lives and not to be murdered by the Roman Church. In fact, because it's Aramaic, while it may incorporate that, it must be much older. All vows. Let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 24.
The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of the bad behavior of the Jews, the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of them. But now, in the last days, the opposite becomes true. The name of the Messiah, Jesus, is now blasphemed among the Jews because of the Gentiles. A lot of this has to do with the broken promises we make to God. To be ready for Jesus to come back, we first of all have to set the trumpet to our mouths, torture our souls, but come to the Day of Atonement in repentance. Confess to God the broken promises that we've made to Him. Now the question becomes, why are there two days of atonement? Why is there a Day of Atonement when Jesus atoned for our sins as the Passover Lamb, but also He atoned for our sins on Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, Jesus is the scapegoat. They had two goats called Sa'ere Zazel in Hebrew. The high priest would symbolically put the sins of the people onto the goat, and then they would take one goat and release it into the wilderness. The other goat, they would drag it through the streets of Jerusalem. The people would kick it, spit on it, beat it with sticks, and mock it for their sin. The same as they paraded Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem. Then they would take it out and sacrifice it. Most Christians know about Jesus being the Lamb. Most Christians do not know about Jesus being the goat. We all know we need the blood of the Lamb. We don't usually think about needing the blood of the goat. Why are there two representations of the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb and the blood of the goat? You have two basic Hebrew words for sin and two Greek equivalents. The first Hebrew word is called chet. It means failure or falling short of the glory of God. Its Greek equivalent is hamarteno. The other Hebrew word is pesha, meaning transgression, going too far, its Greek equivalent being hamartima. So there's two kinds of sins, the sin of going too far and the sin of not going far enough, or you might say sins of omission and sins of commission. The blood of the lamb has to do more with sins of commission. The blood of the goat more with sins of omission. The blood of the lamb has more to do with the sins that we commit before we're saved. The blood of the goat has to do with atonement for sins after we've been saved, particularly sins of ignorance, as we'll see in a moment, the Hebrew word being Barut from Leviticus 5. So they take these goats, one is released, the other, the high priest, they put his hands on it and part the sins of the people onto the goat, take it through the streets of Jerusalem, beat it, kick it, mock it, curse the scapegoat for their sin, and take it out and sacrifice it. Jesus is both the Passover lamb, but the Yom Kippur scapegoat. We need both the blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat. The blood of the lamb having to do more with sins of commission, the blood of the goat with sins of omission. The blood of the lamb more with the things we did before we're saved, the blood of the goat, the things we did after being saved. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. But into the second only, that's the Holy of Holies, HaKodesh Kodeshim, Sanctum Sanctorum, if you prefer Latin, enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Bu Rut. Remember, you have the Greek words, Chet and Pesha, the Greek equivalents, Hamartima and Hamarteno, sins of omission and commission, sins of falling short and sins of going too far. The blood of the Lamb has to do with the sins of commission. The sins of ignorance has to do with the blood of the goat at Yom Kippur. That's why there's two days of atonement.
One more holiday. The Feast of Booths. That's when they sing the Hallel Rabbah, as we'll see tonight. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You sing that from Psalm 118 twice a year in the Jewish liturgy. The Jewish liturgy for a holiday is not called the Siddur. That's the one for Saturdays, Shabbat. The one for holidays is called the Makzor. And you sing the Hallel Rabbah on Passover without palm branches. But you sing it with palm branches, lulavim in Hebrew, at the Feast of Booths. The Jews on Palm Sunday, as we'll look at tonight, began celebrating Palm Sunday, Passover, as if it were booths. We'll explain why they did that later. The Feast of Booths represents the Millennial Kingdom. It's when Jews remember God's provision in the wilderness, but the idea is one of being sojourners in this world on our way to heaven. Let's look at this, please, in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 9, By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, he was looking for the city which has a foundation whose architect and builder is God. The land was promised to him, and it's promised to us the meek shall inherit the earth, but in the meantime, we're sojourners. We have no eternal home in this world. Let's look, please, at Zechariah 14, verse 1. Zechariah 14, 1. The day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. As we continue reading in this, how this will come about. In verse 16, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go to worship from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Verse 19, this will be the punishment for Egypt and the punishment for all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, Jesus comes back. And as we'll see tonight, they recognize that the son of Joseph, the suffering servant, is also the son of David. Or the son of David, the conquering king, is also the suffering servant, the son of Joseph. We'll look at that, Lord willing, later. And they celebrate the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths represents the millennia. But it is also the Jewish feast that ends the annual cycle of reading the Torah and the Law and the Prophets. You read the whole thing annually, but they skip over Isaiah 53. It's actually omitted from the annual rota, from the liturgy, because it points to Jesus being the Messiah. So they skip over Isaiah 53. They actually omit it and have done for centuries. You go back after the Feast of Booths to Genesis 1.1 and you begin reading again. The next day it's called Simcha Torah. If you're ever in Israel, you'll see them dancing with the Torah scrolls, the joy of the Torah. So it's a feast remembering God's provision in the wilderness reminds us that we're sojourning in the wilderness on our way to the kingdom of the Messiah but also, it is a feast of the Bible, of the Word of God that was given. Jewish people, to this day, will build a booth called the Sukkah and eat their meals in it. And it's autumn time now, so you're taking the leaves that are changing color, and you're making the roof with these leaves. And they would use these bushes and leaves to sing Hosanna to Jesus is what they did on Palm Sunday. They began doing it at the wrong time of year. The leaves are changing color, and you eat your meals in this booth with your family, and you read the book of Ecclesiastes. We call it Kohelet in Hebrew. Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, is God's philosophy of life. The Greeks have their Platonic and Socratic philosophers. The Germans have their rationalist philosophers. The English had people like Hobbes, but God's philosophy is the book of Ecclesiastes. God's philosophy says 
that this world is futile. It's all vanity, it's all pride, and ultimately it's futile and it's miserable. Don't hope in it, don't trust in it. Make the best of a bad thing. The world has fallen, make the best of a bad thing, but don't trust this world. Trust in the kingdom of the Messiah. Love God and keep his commandments. That's the conclusion of the matter. And you bring your oldest son into the sukkah, and you say, Bobani, Bobani, come my son. Do you see the way these leaves are changing color? Just a few weeks ago, they were green, and now they're dead. That's the way that our life is in this world. That's the way my life is, and that's the way your life is. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Don't trust in this world. Trust in the Messiah and his kingdom. And you pick up some blades of grass from the roof, and you say, for the grass withers. Then you show him a dead flower from the roof, for the flower fades. But then you hand him the Bible and say, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The feast of the Bible. There's no home in this world. Let's look at a great celebration of the Feast of Booths, Hag Sukkot. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. It has a lot to do with the subject of God's pattern for revival. Nehemiah chapter 8, please. And all the people, in verse 1, gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. That is where they brought the living water into Jerusalem. It's where the Maim Hayim, it's where the living water was flowing. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law, the word of God, before the assembly. Men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday. Bible studies that went on for hours. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand. Why? Because people lost their Hebrew in the captivity in Babylon. They knew Aramaic. Later there were translations called Targumim into Aramaic so the people could understand the Bible again. They couldn't all remember Hebrew. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. <clears throat> and Ezra the scribe stood at the pulpit, the wooden podium, which they'd made for the purpose. And next to him were all these people, and all these names mean something in Hebrew. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. He was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the people, and blessed the Lord the great God. And the people said, Amen, Amen. While lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces. Now let's continue. Verse 14. In verse 12, they go to celebrate a great festival. But in verse 14, they found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches, wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and bought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And the entire assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel indeed had not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was a great festival. And look what happened at the Feast of Booths. It's the Feast of the Bible. He read from the book of the law of God daily. From the first day to the last, they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. This is God's pattern for revival. Every time you had a major revival in Israel, Hezekiah's revival, Josiah's revival, it doesn't matter. You see them celebrating big Passovers. Why? Unless there is a radical return to the cross, to the blood of the Lamb, there will never be a revival. All this signs and wonders stuff, when signs and wonders are amplified above repentance and the blood of the Lamb, they'll never bring revival. Never. 
We'll look at that later. But secondly, here they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. What was this feast? What was central to it? Dwelling in booths, not trusting in this world, and reading the Word of God. Let's look at the real pattern for revival. Chapter 8, verse 1, they're at the water gate. That's where the Holy Spirit flowed. That's where the Maim Hayim, the living water, comes in. The first thing that happens in a revival is the Holy Spirit is outpoured. The living water flows. So far, so good. That happened with the charismatic movement at the beginning. But then what happens? At the water gate in verse 3, from early morning until midday, the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood at the podium, and he read the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. And Ezra blessed the Lord, and all the people said, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshipped. That's the pattern of revival. The Holy Spirit flows. It falls, and it flows. Then the people go to the Word of God, and then that drives them into worship. The charismatic movement has taken out the Word of God. We just want the Spirit, and we want this stuff, without having it based on the teaching of Scripture. So what you have are crackpot churches with crackpot ministers. I have a word for you. This is God's prophecy for you. Most of it is not from God at all. And when you see people going to churches like that, following gurus like that, that tells you two things about that person. First of all, their prayer life isn't very good, but certainly they're not in the Word of God. They're not reading it. If people were in the Word of God, they wouldn't be needing so many words and prophecies and all this kind of stuff. Not only that, but unless somebody is in the Word of God, you won't know if a prophecy or a vision or a word of wisdom is from God or not, because you won't know how to test it. So instead we have crackpots following crackpot ministers and crackpot churches. Meanwhile, the church continues to fail, and society continues on its way to hell because of a wrong idea of revival. Instead of revival, we have hype. What you see today happening in most of the charismatic and Pentecostal movement is hype. Once again, the charismatic movement is 26 years old. Is society any better off now than it was 26 years ago? No, it's worse. It can't even revive the church. How can it revive a dying society? The first problem of the charismatic movement is this. They want the worship, they want the living water to flow and have the worship, but they don't want the Word of God. So the whole thing comes to nothing. Once again, look at Isaiah 24. Verses 7 and 8. The new wine warns, the vine decays, the merry-hearted sigh, the gaiety of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the reveler stops, and the gaiety of the harp comes to an end. So much for the charismatic movement. References in Lamentations 5.15, Amos 5.21, etc. The Jews were not ready for Jesus to come the first time because they did not properly understand the true meaning of the spring holidays. Christians are not going to be ready for Jesus to come back unless they properly understand the meaning of the autumn holidays. What frightens me the most is the heretical teaching of Paul Crouch in the United States. He says, don't talk to me about doctrine. I don't want to know about doctrine. People who are going around judging other ministries for not being scriptural are going straight to hell, he says. The New Testament contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. Why? Because unless we have right doctrine, we won't know what right conduct is. All Scripture is inspired, valid for correction, for correcting me, for correcting all of us. You can't believe Jesus Christ and Paul Crouch. You can't believe both. Either Jesus is right and Paul Crouch is telling something that's not true, well, Paul Crouch is right and Jesus is wrong, but you can't believe Jesus and Paul Crouch. It's impossible. Either one of them is telling the truth and one of them is lying, or at least very, very seriously misguided. If there's not a radical return to the Word of God, there'll never be a revival. And if there's not a radical return to the blood of the Lamb and its theme of repentance, there'll never be a revival. 
The first holiday and the last are, in a sense, the two most important, as we'll see tonight. To be ready for Jesus to come. The first thing we have to do is to realize it's beginning to rain again. It's autumn time. God is beginning to deal with Israel again. Jews are beginning to get saved. They're back in their land. We see prophecy being fulfilled in Europe, a reconfederation of the Roman Empire. We see the emergence of Babylon, the false religious system of the world merging. When you see the Pope meeting with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Dalai Lama, who's worshipped as God by Tibetan Buddhists, meeting with Zoroastrian priests, witch doctors, and all sorts, in Assisi, Italy, or Canterbury Cathedral, that's Babylon. Coming more and more into confederation with the false religion of the world. That fulfills prophecy. We need to set the trumpets to our mouths. It's always important to witness to people. Evangelism is always important. Every unsaved person, your unsaved mother, your unsaved father, your unsaved children, your unsaved brother, your unsaved sister, your unsaved husband, your unsaved wife, they're all running out of time. But we've reached a point in history where mankind is running out of time. Set the trumpet to our mouths. How does this latter rain fall? What does it say in Joel 2? Let the priests weep. There has to be repentance among the people of God. Repentance will never come to society until it comes to us. And then we have to torture our souls about our sin. To be ready for Jesus to come, we have to be serious about our own sin before we can do those people any good. Torture our souls. We all need to tell the unsaved that they need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. But we need to tell ourselves we need to be washed in the blood of the goat. Thirdly, we need to dwell in booths. Don't trust in this life or this world. Jesus warned unsaved people through Peter, so it will be in the days of Noah, a preacher of righteousness. They wouldn't listen to him until it was too late. And they got on the ark, which is a type of the church, and the door closed, and they couldn't be saved anymore. That's the days of Noah for the unsaved. But he tells us, as it was in the days of Noah, people will be eating and drinking and getting married and given in marriage. There's nothing wrong with eating, nothing wrong with drinking, nothing wrong with getting married. But when that becomes your obsession, you're trusting in this world. We're sojourners living in booths. We need to have the living water flowing. We need to go radically to the Word of God. And then we need to worship that pattern, God's pattern. Not the pattern you see the charismatic movement following now. It's not biblical. Dwelling in booths. You see the leaves? They're changing color. They're dying. What does that mean? It's the feast of the Bible. For the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The autumn holidays. The Jews were not ready for the Messiah to come the first time because they didn't understand the spring holidays. For us to be ready for Jesus to come again, we have to understand the autumn holidays. Most Jews didn't understand the meaning of the spring holidays. Most Christians don't understand the meaning of the fall holidays. As a result, most Jews we're not ready for Jesus to come the first time, only a remnant. As a result, most Christians are not going to be ready for Jesus to come back, only a remnant. May the God of Israel, in his grace and in his mercy, help us and our families to be among that remnant. 
God bless you.